Audience participation in theatre. How much is too much and where do you draw the line? That's the question that I inadvertently set out to answer when I stepped into the Wyndham's Theatre here in London's West End to watch Sexy Oklahoma, also known as the Oklahoma Revival. Now, in this case, I was actually running late that day, so I ran into the theatre, scrambled into my seat in the third row and sat down right in front of Jon Snow, the presenter from Channel 4, which was really quite disorienting but the show began literally as i sat down and i was a little surprised at first because all the house lights stayed on and they've decked out the theater to look really gorgeous the set is really unique because it almost has this feel of being in like a recording studio because you've got these these wooden walls that have been plastered all over the theater but they're adorned with guns which pulls you very firmly out of it being a recording studio and into this american kind of town barn hall feel and the show begins and there's characters singing and there's talking and there's discussion and again all the house lights are on and so i'm like okay this is interesting i can see everything around me right now that's not something i see super often but at the same time i mean it's not a big deal right then a little later in the show there's a moment where all of the lights go off and this i adored i had so much fun sitting there in pitch black not being able to see a single thing and because your eyes have obviously got accustomed to the house lights being on as soon as they all go off your eyes take several minutes to adjust and because there's genuinely no light on stage they're just trying and trying to adjust to nothingness but while this is happening there's a conversation being carried out between these two characters and the darkness is meant to embody the fact that they're inside this little bolt hole almost which is where this one guy lives and where another guy has gone to confront him it's meant to be tucked away and secretive and almost a bit intimate as well and then in a move that i was so head over heels in love with they bring out a video camera and it's essentially a night vision camera and they are recording these two actors doing this scene together holding microphones whispering in each other's faces their faces were this far apart and the camera is a mega close-up on one of their faces i mean i've probably got a way to actually demonstrate that here somehow let's see if this is gonna work if i click this yeah there we go it was like this close <laughs> And that's all projected on the wall behind them while they're speaking. So you're illuminated by this sort of ghostly glow. But there are also glimpses that you get of the audience because the camera is facing diagonally towards the actor and the audience themselves. And it's, it's an emotional moment because one of the characters is essentially saying, like, what if you got that rope over there and you stood on that wooden log and you tied it and you kicked the log away and that was the end of you? And he's almost willing him to do it and showing his disdain for him and then a little moment later they draw a gun and they shoot the gun into the air inside again this very dark area and so all of this like i said is illuminated by the projection on the back wall but they fire the gun and one of the lights at the top of the theater turns on and acts as this pillar of light shining down where they've clearly shot a hole in the roof and the way all of that was constructed just yes it made my heart sing but that's not really audience participation the audience were present a little in that shot and it certainly engaged the audience in a very different way to what you'd normally expect it was a, a, a different sensory kind of landscape to explore but again in terms of participation pretty muted so let's talk about something a little bit more on the nose shall we specifically there's a moment where this character is singing about how she kind of can't say no to men and she feels sorry for them when they make advances towards her and so she kind of sleeps around and that's kind of the vibe that she gives off and she at one point goes off stage off the front of the stage steps down past the musicians who are on stage the entire time as well in their own little sort of pit except it's an exposed pit it's not underneath or anything i really loved how they included the musicians in this show i thought it was fantastic that she steps down asks the person in the front center seat of the front row of the stalls to step out of her seat so she can climb on that seat and reach over to the person that's in the row behind and then directly serenades the poor man that was sitting there and talks so much about about how much she wants him and stuff like that and it was a really forward moment 
And it lasted a good three minutes or so. And the guy obviously is like bright red at this point and he's sort of trying to maintain his composure and she's really being very suggestive with her singing. And then eventually she gets back on stage, but she's still sort of looking over to him. And it was like, oh my goodness, okay, that was... That was intense. And she evicted someone out of her seat in order to get that seat free so she could do that. So that's pretty intense, right? But again, up to this point, I would say this is all within the realms of just a bit of good fun. Like it's almost a panto kind of move. So yeah, sure. But then later in the show, there was a really unusual moment, I think, which shocked me quite a bit. It wasn't like a big deal, but this one character who is a peddler. He sells things, he travels around the country, he buys things, he sells them again. That's his kind of way of life. He's drinking a Bud Light, which they've got on stage. They have a pack of Bud Lights throughout the show. And it's meant to be this party moment. And he opens up this Bud Light and just shakes and pours it over all the sort of front row of the show. And especially the woman that was evicted from her seat before and the woman next to her, they were absolutely covered in it. Like their arms were wet. I could see them sort of wiping big globs of Bud bud Light off them. And I don't know if it was actually Bud Light or if it was like carbonated water. It looked fizzy. It didn't just look like regular water because that wouldn't have shaken up in the same way. But either way, like I assume that there are some people out there that would go to the theater, sit in the front center row of the stalls, think they had the best seat in the house, get doused with Bud Light and end up being pretty peeved in my experience with the people that I saw the show with. They seemed to think that it was all great. I mean, they were very embarrassed about it, but they still had a good time. And this had all happened also after, again, more sort of direct address to those audience members. And it has really made me wonder, like, what would they do if someone was really unhappy with that? Like, in the moment, do they have a contingency plan? Do they have some kind of plan B or backup or do they even speak to those people in advance maybe and say, hey, just so you know, front row is going to have a sort of slightly more involved time at this show? Or is it just a gamble? And if it is, I mean, that's brave as hell. And admittedly, I think that this is quite a brave production. There's a lot about it that I actually really loved. And I want to keep my review format a little atypical here compared to some of the other reviews that I post spoiler alert, I post other reviews, so you should subscribe to the channel. But I just want to orient this one a little differently because it was a really different show. And I went in with expectations that it was going to be a little boring, but I also knew that it was meant to be sexy somehow. And it ended up being less sexy than I imagined it was going to be, but also a lot less boring. And one special commendation I want to give to the show is actually the lighting was fantastic. First of all, I do want to mention that. The band, brilliant, absolutely love the band. But the start of Act 2 in this show is the best start to an Act 2 I've ever seen. You basically have this setup where a woman is going to drink an elixir or she's going to smell an elixir, smelling salts, and that's going to clear her mind and give her clarity in helping her make a decision. And so the act begins with this, this dream sequence of that moment happening, that decision being made with a dancer who you've not seen anywhere else in the show. She's not been in it prior, but she comes on stage and starts doing this, this galloping dance around the stage. And I think that it's very much meant to represent the idea of of being chaotic of mind or or fleet of thought or however you might want to describe it. Basically, having a lot going on in your head. And her dancing is is really, she's she's sort of contorting in moments, she's acrobatic in moments, she's she's gazelle-like or or, or almost acting as a horse in moments, galloping around. It's really quite an impressive performance. But then this elixir is smelled, and as that happens, a plume of smoke billows out onto the stage and onto the audience as well. And I don't want to describe this as just like a smoke machine, you know, doing that thing where dry ice kind of rolls out slowly and slowly fills up the auditorium or whatever. It wasn't like that at all. This was like a smoke grenade had gone off, like it unfurled and plumed outwards and and curled upwards and, and really billowed into the audience in a big way, but it was contained. It didn't sort of dissipate or evaporate very quickly. It was this big blob, like a big mass of cotton wool that was expanding in front of your eyes and 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 this 3D feel to it. I mean, obviously it was three-dimensional, but it really broke the barrier between stage and audience in a fascinating way for me because it was it was curling up and above around me and 
then you're sort of looking through the smoke and you can see this dancer still doing her dance and, 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 and she's still just as frantic as before, but it's in the clouds now. And all the other folks that are there and they're, they're here for this party, they end up doing this song that is so rousing and they're stamping on the ground and there's one character that's crawling around in the fog and it's just absolutely crazy powerful. Like I was sitting there with a massive grin on my face. It was unlike anything I've ever seen before. And I think Oklahoma deserves massive amounts of credit for it. And so all of this, all of the, the sum of all of these things has really just made me mull over the question of how much is too much? And when you're playing with the line between audience and stage and that fourth wall is, is being bent and it's being pushed into and it's being broken, where is the balance to be found? And I'd love to hear if there are any shows that you've seen which really successfully play with that or if there are any others that have kind of failed in their attempts to do so. Theatre would certainly be a lot less fun if it did that all the time. Like a lot of the time you do want to go and just see a contained piece that's over there and you're over here. But in Oklahoma, I think it only elevated the show, but also I wasn't having Bud Light poured on me. So maybe that makes me a little biased. I'd love to hear what you think. And my final rating for Oklahoma is a strong recommendation to go see it. I think that they make some very bold choices, which I'm very glad that they made and that certainly made the revival a lot more interesting than I think it probably otherwise would have been. And I'm going to give it a strong four stars.